the big thing is how to get out of here and actually know it in your body. And so that's going to take some time to do that. And um, But this is an amazing edible. And as James Duke, one of my teachers, uh, probably the most famous of my teachers in this country, uh, James Duke lives down in Maryland, uh, says, why don't we harvest and not weed? And it's a whole different approach. It's a whole different approach. And so going out and knowing what you're pulling from the ground, saying, oh, that doesn't mean you have to eat all the smart weed you get. But I'm saying, at least when you're harvesting, say, oh, this is food. This is food. And I'm going to give it to the compost this time and feed the compost. But I know that I could feed myself. And we're going to see some plants now that people actually pull up to plant other plants. And the plants they're pulling up have more nutrients, more energy than yeah. the plants that they're planting. And we've been doing that since we landed here, you know, since the white people landed here. You know, we, we landed, we said, isn't that a great oak forest? Let's chop it all down and plant our rows and build our houses. And of course, you know, the, the native people came over the hill, saw the ancient oak forest that they loved, chopped down, and the battles began, you know? And, and we, just, we just didn't slow down. We just didn't take the time to look around and say, what's here? This kind of scares people a little bit, and if you're feeling it, it's understandable. When you realize how much food is just coming up out of the ground, all over the place, there's so much of it. We can easily fill our bellies every day. And if we use any foresight of storing <coughs> food, I'm really into green powder, so taking these uh, smart weeds and drying them and making a powder that you can make with bras or teas later is mm -hmm. something to be paying attention to and knowing how to do that. That's one of the areas that uh, I get into a lot. So, so your smart weeds are, are important to bring in and get to know who they are, and they taste really good. Realize most of the world, 80% of the world, doesn't need to go on this walk, you know? They already know the weeds that are around them. They already know the plants that are around them. And they go out each day. This is one of the ones that has a little smart to it. Anyone feel that little? They, most of them don't, but some of them do. This one does. Um, and, and so they, what, the, what, is the, what do most of the people in the world do? They have one main meal a day. They go outside, they walk around their house, they walk around their hut or whatever, wherever they live, and they pick, um, they pick the weeds and the plants that are around that are abundant. They fill a basket with those, they go back to their house, they steam those, add some spices, cook them down, they cook a starch, you know, half the world eats rice a day, corn, potatoes, root vegetables, Cassava, 20 per 30 percent of the world eats cassava. Who here has had cassava? All right. Well, how, all of you have. You just called it tapioca, you know. But it's really, I don't know how we, at least we kept it as a little bit of a food in this little <laughs> side way. But realize that 30 percent of the world, this is their major starch. It's cassava. Yucca is another name for it. Uh, manioc is another name for it. So realize that this is part of reaching out. And then that's how they fill their belly. They don't go to a store. They don't buy things. Then they go from that full belly out and take advantage of whatever's in the butt that's around. You know? and they're not coming from this, ooh, I need to have a job so I can have food. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is the thing I'm talking to you about, is how to reach out and connect to that. Now here's a cool plant that's coming up that a lot of you probably have been conditioned to hate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, this is ragweed. Mm -hmm. that's all that? This awesome. is ragweed. Uh, yeah, well, actually... Uh, these are different, okay, which is actually what a great opportunity. Now, you know, to those of you who haven't walked with me before, you say, oh, what an interesting coincidence. But it's really a coincidence because it happens all the time that the plant <laughs> I'm showing has an example next to it to help you illustrate that these are two different things. It's really easy to see when you look underneath the leaf. It's silvery. How different they are, mm -hmm. right. So these are two very, very important plants. It's a very important plant, but it's different. So we'll start with this one. Which is ragweed. This is ragweed. <coughs> and this is called Ambrosia. What a beautiful genus, right? Mm -hmm. Not all the genera are like wah, wah. There's, some of them are really beautiful names. Ambrosia Artemisia folia. <coughs> okay? What are they saying? They're saying the leaf of this looks like an Artemisia. Now we're going to meet an Artemisia in a minute. Over here. And uh, so this is Ambrosia Artemisia folia. There's other species of ambrosia around, but this is the most common one. And it comes up, and we know it as the one that gives me 70% of the allergies comes from the pollen. It's not goldenrod, <laughs> that's a misinformation. Goldenrod does not cause your allergies. It just happens to be flowering at the same time, and it's yellow, and everybody sees this. This one comes up and has greenish 
flower, so it stands back, but it dumps out the yellow pollen into the air. It causes the irritation up, up in the nose and in the mouth and the itchy and all that. But what's amazing about this plant is that in the plant is an antihistamine. So the solution is in the problem. Uh. Isn't that incredible? And you can, it's, a, it's really remarkable because even, it, you can use it for treating itself, but you can use it for treating any kind of those allergies that you get when, the, like they're cutting the hay now, and that gets my nose a little bit. If you chew on a little, it's not food, but you chew on a few leaves, all your symptoms will go away for about an hour and a half or so. And if you chew it again, chew some more again, then they'll go away for another couple hours and get you through that little window of time when those things are going off. So I would recommend if you're somebody who has a lot of ragweed allergies is that you start making a tea of these uh, on a regular basis so that you get your body's histamine system conditioned and recognizing this as a, as a plant. So, processing it, yeah. you know, by making a tea, which is yeah. heating it, you're yeah. not destroying the histamine. You know, just like pasteurizing milk, you're not destroying all the good stuff in there. Right. right. No, you're not in this case. So that, that's a very good question of what, how do we make things? How do we prepare things? And that's a big thing we've lost in our society because we've confused cleanliness with sterility. And so we've gone, we've moved all our food and our hygiene to sterility levels and we're killing off all the flora, either the living uh, mechanisms within the plant or we're, uh, you know, or we're actually, you know, killing off uh, externally and trying to kill things off. So uh, when you make this into the tea, the, the chemical that is in here, the, uh, the um, is actually fine, it's stabilized. I wouldn't boil this. I would boil water, throw it in, and let it steep for 20, 30 minutes if you were going to make a strong tea of it. A sun tea? You can. You can do a sun tea. Mm -hmm. So those are two two different ways to do it. But the chemical in here is, is stable. So some things are sensitive to boiling. All living processes, right? And enzymes are, are, are uh, vulnerable to that. But alkaloids and other things don't mind being boiled. And some things need to be boiled to pull them into solution. So uh, so this is a very stable, ambrosia is a very stable uh, being. Mm -hmm. You said you 